Hello, everyone, and welcome to FAIR's free webinar series. My name is Carrie Mokowski, National Programs Manager at FAIR, and your moderator for today's presentation, Anaphylaxis, Food Allergy and Asthma, Answering Your Questions. This presentation will examine how these allergic conditions might relate to each other, discuss some of the symptoms they share in common, and offer guidance to help protect young people with food allergies. The content for today was derived from the many questions we received from our food allergy families throughout the year. This presentation has been pre-recorded. Funding for this webinar was made possible in part through a 2016 grant from Milan Specialty LP. We thank Dr. Bassett, who serves as a guest speaker for this webinar and does not receive any compensation for his appearance. FAIR sincerely appreciates Dr. Bassett for his time and efforts to help educate our community. So our guest speaker today is Dr. Clifford Bassett. Dr. Bassett is the Medical Director of Allergy and Asthma Care of New York. He is on the faculty of the New York University School of Medicine, the Weill Cornell Medical College, and the State University of New York Downstate Medical Center. We hope everyone finds this session valuable. At this time, I am delighted to turn the presentation over to Dr. Bassett. Thank you so much for allowing me to participate on FAIR's webinar series. And we'll be starting today with the basics, risk factors of allergic reactions or anaphylaxis. There are some risk factors on the slides, history of allergy, food allergy, peanut, tree nut, fish, shellfish, et cetera, history of asthma, especially very important today, we'll be covering this again shortly, when asthma is not properly controlled. That's a very important factor. Family history of anaphylaxis and a prior history of allergic reactions. Other specific food-related factors may be alcohol, alcoholic beverages, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, which together have been shown in some research studies to increase absorption of the food and perhaps lead to quicker symptoms. Another factor, again, is the quantity of the food. Studies out of the U.S. and Germany show that peanuts and tree nuts are a leading cause of severe anaphylaxis, followed by shellfish and fish. A very important note, future reactions may be more severe than the first or initial reaction. In fact, many persons with life-threatening reactions initially had only mild reactions, and that's surprising to some patients and individuals when I discuss this with them. Uh, slide five. Now we're switching over to fatal anaphylaxis risks. Before I do that, I just want to point out again, 90% of most common food allergies in the USA, cow's milk, egg, soy, peanut, nuts, fish, and shellfish. And we don't have a lot of time to go into some newer trends. We are seeing an allergy to seeds being more reported, uh, particularly in the Middle East and in Israel. And reactions to fruits and vegetables are more commonly reported a specific type of food allergy in adults referred to as oral allergy or pollen food allergy syndrome, and we won't be covering that today. It's fairly prevalent, and again, if you have symptoms related to fresh fruits and vegetables, see an allergist for expert-level care and further management. Going back to the sad tale of fatal anaphylaxis, these are some risks we learn, having a history of asthma, a delay in epinephrine injection, or it not being immediately available. Young adults and adolescents, they may also take high-risk behaviors, and therefore they may think the rules don't apply to them and not carry their auto-injectors with them when they need it, particularly when going out and so forth. And finally, experience prior reactions. Again, prior severity does not always reliably predict future severity of reactions. And we know approximately 1% or less of anaphylaxis may prove fatal. Next slide, please. Let's refresh some common signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis. If you have suffered a severe allergic reaction in the past, whatever the cause, you, are much great, you have a much greater risk of a future reaction. Initial symptoms, again, hives, itchiness, redness of the skin, itchiness of the mouth and ears, stuffy nose, sneezing, itchy nose, and finally respiratory symptoms, cough, and other things as we go into more persistent or severe symptoms, which may be obstruction of the airway because of swelling of the lips, tongue, throat, trouble swallowing, 
shortness of breath or wheezing, chest tightness. And again, we're going to come to that in a few minutes. We talk about an overlap between asthma and anaphylaxis and what are some ways to tell the differences and be better prepared. And finally, somebody with confusion, feeling weak, passing out, those are symptoms of severe anaphylaxis. Again, severe symptoms alone or in combination with milder symptoms may be signs of anaphylaxis and, of course, require immediate treatment. A person may also have different symptoms at different times and on subsequent reactions, they may not be the same. So that's a very important point as well. Next slide, please. The severity of anaphylaxis is often dependent on various patient as well as other factors, including the environment. So of course, we see here in the slide the amount and type of the allergen exposure. The route of administration, is it an injection? Is it oral? The presence of asthma, again, Exercise can certainly be a trigger in some individuals, and whether the person is well or being treated for an infection, and finally, the degree of allergic sensitivity in that individual. Again, past history of severe allergic reactions or anaphylaxis does not imply the same reaction in the future. And again, I tell my patients anaphylaxis is the, is the letter U, unpredictable. Next slide. Rising prevalence of asthma. As an asthma specialist as well, we see in many studies throughout the world, particularly here in the United States, a doubling the number of affected children with asthma over the last couple decades. The National Health Interview Survey in 2008 found that as many as one out of 10 children may indeed have asthma. Next slide. Let's talk a little bit about asthma. Let's define it and explain what we're really trying to convey. A personal history of respiratory symptoms such as cough, wheezing, or shortness of breath. Now, the main features of asthma include the following. The lower respiratory passages or airways are more sensitive, and therefore, they're more likely to be affected by a variety of asthma triggers or allergies, a pet cat, pollen, mold spores, and so forth. Inflammation and swelling does occur in the lining of the lungs, and, of course, this concept of bronchospasm, tightening of the muscles around the breathing passages or the airways and as a result, there can be a restriction in the normal movement of air. You can hear the sound of wheezing and the sensation the patient may have of shortness of breath. Now, asthma does not discriminate. My son had been hospitalized as a young child with asthma, and so we understand and we're very empathetic for individuals who have this condition. The bottom line is whether you work with uh, your doctor or a specialist, asthma is a treatable condition. When I started as an allergist two decades ago, there were 5,000 deaths per year from asthma, and now the number is down to below 2,500. So we are moving in the right direction, and guidelines and resources and programs like this are a wonderful way to share information to improve care. Okay, the next slide, please. I'm just going to digress a little bit and talk about reactive airways disease. Over the past few years, it's changed, and people are more comfortable using the term asthma, and so are providers. But reactive airways disease was an older term that referred to very, very young children that presented with wheezing, what seemed to be reversible airway narrowing due to a variety of triggers, which are most often caused by respiratory infection, particularly viruses. So instead of the diagnosis of, of asthma in a very young child, the diagnosis of asthma is not always able to be confirmed. And the previous term of reactive airway disease, or RAD, may imply. Today, we typically are more comfortable on all levels with the diagnosis of asthma. Next slide. In asthma and in severe asthma, we're worried about having the following. And the most common cause of fatalities in asthma is severe asthma. And what happens is you have airway compromise, obstruction of the respiratory passages, as we just mentioned, restriction of airflow, and additionally, we believe that underlying asthma makes respiratory passages more hypersensitive or sensitive to a variety of indoor and outdoor triggers. Now, let's talk about anaphylaxis, and we're going to, in a moment, talk about asthma as well and contrast the two, since the symptoms, again, as I mentioned repeatedly, overlap frequently. Anaphylaxis is a potentially life-threatening allergic reaction. Symptoms are commonly known cough wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, and so forth. And we know that food allergic reactions may be responsible for respiratory symptoms and occur in up to one half of patients. The bottom line is there's a great deal of overlap 
in common respiratory symptoms in both conditions. Next slide. Again, looking at this association between asthma and food allergy, it is unknown whether there's a link or an association between asthma and food allergy. Is it due to an underlying predisposition? In other words, is there an underlying allergy? Or is it that there's a true cause and effect relationship in these persons? And a couple studies below, both Julie Wang at Mount Sinai and others, have looked at this type of question and we're trying to understand how it applies to our families and individuals who have asthma and also may have food allergies. Again, does having asthma increase the risk of a severe anaphylactic reaction? Well, we know that children with food allergies and asthma are at greater risk for near and fatal allergic reactions, especially when their asthma, again, is not well controlled. Next slide, please. There is an apparent rise in asthma and food allergies over the past several decades. However, the true prevalence of food allergy is not really a simple measurement, whether it's through a skin test, a blood test, and so forth, and allergy test results need to be evaluated by a trained professional, such as an allergist. The key for me every day is interpretation of the test result and applying it in an appropriate fashion. Again, not to over-test or not test when it's indicated, but do testing really when it's warranted. That means no broad spectrum screening individuals when they don't have symptoms that justify testing, and that's very important. And many of my colleagues in pediatric allergy and immunology feel the same way. There are some risk factors uh, for food allergies in some studies. Uh, in, in, in this case, male gender, age of child, and either, even ethnic differences as well. Next, next slide. So in young children, food allergies often occur before asthma develops and therefore may be a risk factor in those children with persistent asthma. In a few studies, they have also looked at egg sensitivity being associated as a risk factor for future allergic rhinitis, that's indoor seasonal pollen sensitivity, as well as the later development of asthma. Fortunately, a majority of children do outgrow egg allergy. Next slide. Let's talk about this relationship a little bit more. Food allergies can vary in the way they present, including respiratory symptoms. Again, wheezing, cough, tightness in your chest, and so forth. Food allergies does not generally present with day-to-day -day respiratory symptoms. They're more episodic. A history of asthma does appear to worsen or complicate food allergic reactions, as we mentioned. And some researchers have estimated that food allergic reactions cause respiratory type symptoms, as mentioned above, in at least one third of episodes. Next slide. There's even studies looking at the persistent cow's milk allergy may be a future predictor of asthma. Studies that from the West Coast, some HMO studies and other studies also look at the risk of anaphylaxis again, is greater in those with severe asthma as compared to those without severe asthma. Next slide. Let's talk about some management ideas. Well, first, as an allergist, my job is to confirm the diagnosis of a food allergy. Bring copies to our offices or your provider of prior blood tests, allergy skin tests, so they can see exactly what's been done in the past. We spent a great deal of time, and so does the FAIR website have great information on label decoding. I teach my patients also to be a label detective. Understanding the chemical and food allergy names. Use of a chef card, which is particularly important when eating or ordering out, particularly during the holidays. Food allergy education, again, among family, friends, and school staff and coaches. And finally, the cornerstone, the emergency anaphylaxis action plan, which should be written and begins with having prescribed emergency medications immediately available, notably an epinephrine autoinjector that is first-line treatment for anaphylaxis. Next slide. The question is, when do we use an epinephrine autoinjector? What are the circumstances? What to do if you're not sure if the symptoms are due to asthma or anaphylaxis? And that's a very fair question. Again, it depends on the setting. It depends on the child or the family, if asthma is present, if it's well controlled, and if the child is in a restaurant setting or somewhere where it's uncontrolled, where he may be exposed or she may be exposed to food. So the context and the scenario is also very important in understanding the exact nature of the reaction. Now, most authorities would agree that any food allergic child who has experienced or is, or is experiencing a life-threatening anaphylactic reaction should be given intramuscular epinephrine 
and transported to a hospital immediately if a food allergen injection is strongly suspected. Again, that goes back to your written asthma, anaphy asthma and in this case, anaphylaxis action plan. And a pivotal study that uh, went over this was a few Samson uh, in anaphylaxis and emergency treatment published in pediatrics many years ago, which talks about timely availability of epinephrine in the right situation, and then we're talking today about severe anaphylaxis. The next slide talks a little bit about preparation. Practice with your injection technique using an auto-injector. Review the recently revised food allergy and anaphylaxis emergency care plan. You and your child should always carry epinephrine if prescribed by your practitioner. If the child's parents indicate that the child can carry the medication, always double check and have it with them when leaving the house. It is strongly recommended to carry two auto-injectors in case a second epinephrine dose is needed. Due to a concept called biphasic reactions, we think in up to one out of five episodes of anaphylaxis, there may be a delayed reaction or a recurrent reaction hours later. And it's very important to understand and review this with your practitioner, the difference between an immediate reaction, a delayed reaction, or a protracted reaction. Next slide. So how can families train relatives and caregivers to understand the nature of anaphylaxis? And is there additional advice for families in managing both these conditions, which you see can often coexist, food allergies and asthma? Obviously, we want to optimize asthma control. And we didn't talk a great deal about the NIH guidelines that have been around for three or four decades in terms of getting everybody on the same page. Education, learning the right medications and procedures at the right time for the right child for the right situation, and of course, talking about preventing bad outcomes. Utilizing comprehensive patient, family, and caregiver education. Communication with the big C is very important. And we're talking about largely avoidance measures being prepared, and again, following that action plan. Next slide. The role of caregivers, the child's parents should feel that you are informed and can be trusted to provide care when needed. Accidents can always happen, and it's imperative that you learn as much as you can about the child's food allergies and are prepared in case of a reaction. And on the FAIR website, they have several suggestions and tips in terms of how to do that at home. Keep in mind that food allergies can also take an emotional toll on the child and the family. And they will definitely need your support, especially feeling anxious. The last slide, we're talking again about a concept called cross-contact. Now, some people can be confusing that with cross-contamination, such as food poisoning in a restaurant or food that's gone bad. We're talking about cross-contact. That means it's important to understand that the countertops should be thoroughly cleaned. Pots and pans and so forth, there may be food contact with an ingredient that's left behind hot, soapy water and using a clean disposable cloth uh, before preparing surfaces to ensure allergy-free foods when, whenever humanly possible. Brightly colored stickers on safe food items for younger children. And beware of non-food items that may contain allergens, which are less common. Again, I'm a big fan of the chef card or food ingredient card. And of course, calling ahead to inform your host and your staff when dining out. Next slide. I try to answer many of the questions that we've received over the last year when it comes to anaphylaxis, food allergy, and today we brought another topic in, asthma. They often coexist. Again, this is not a substitute for individual management for your child or your family. See your practitioner, see a board-certified allergist this year to get appropriate evaluation and appropriate management. We're all in the same business, keeping people healthy and still enjoying the holidays and beyond. Thank you so much for allowing me to participate in this brief description on this topic, and I thank FAIR for the excellent work they do every day. Great. Thank you, Dr. Bassett. That was really helpful and super informative. Um, I'd like to once again give a huge thanks to Dr. Bassett for joining us today and providing some really excellent insights into anaphylaxis, food allergy, and asthma. Um, thanks again. Until next time.